good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here, uh, and I'm particularly honored to be able to welcome uh, Minister of Defense Le Drian. Um, I had not, I'd known him reputationally, but had not had a chance to meet him until just last night, and uh, was enormously impressed by uh, a strategic intellect and a, and a, and a man of uh, intense purpose and was uh, transfixed really by his vision for the responsibilities that France bears these days and his willingness to lead the country to deal with these. Um, not every man rises to the measure of responsibility when challenges come, but Minister Le Drian did. Uh, when the rest of the world was watching the advance of insurgents uh, in Mali, the minister saw the essential importance for France to take the lead and to do something significant on behalf of Europe, on behalf of all of us. Uh, and we look with uh, genuine admiration on that quality of leadership, and it has been exceptionally important for all of us that he's been willing to do this. Uh, we're fortunate to have him with us here today. This is the second time we've had a chance to host the minister. But we are delighted that he's here today. Uh, it's a very important time. We hope that he'll share with us his perspective and insights on these challenges that France is shouldering in Africa. But it is for everyone. And it's that leadership that I most admire. And so I would ask you, with your applause, to please welcome the Minister of Defense for the Republic of France, Jean-Yves Le Drian. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear John. Thank you for these uh, warm words, perhaps a little bit undeserved uh, for my person. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely happy to spend this time with you and to uh, speak in front of uh, CSIS this morning in a uh, visit to the United States. This gentleman hadn't seen the window. In my visit to the United States, which uh, happens at a time when our relationship have never been that strong in a long, long time, both uh, because of our action in a certain theater of operations that I'm going to talk about because I'm going to especially talk about Africa, but also as uh, actors of global security. We have been able to notice synergies of strengthened actions for the last several months, and I'm convinced that uh, the visit of President Hollande in a few days, the state visit, will uh, strengthen even that partnership. I have chosen to talk about Africa. I will try to do it uh, quickly so that we can have a Q&A session. First of all, because uh, Africa is a territory which uh, covers a huge potential of growth and development because it is a territory which also counts in the history of France and the history of Europe. Uh, Africa is a priority zone for us because of these historical links, but also because Africa is uh, the zone of all dangers right now. France, at the end of uh, 2013, 
made public its white paper on defense and security, which uh, details the perspectives of our long-term strategy, which was translated through a uh, military reprogramming, which has been ratified by the French Parliament at the end of 2013. And within the description of the international landscape and the questions linked to international security, we put forward both uh, the threats of uh, force, that is to say proliferation, but also the risks of weakness, especially with a special mention to failed states, which because of the absence of the weakness of state structures become uh, sources of instability, violence, trafficking, and regional insecurity. And uh, these situations today for Africa are a major threat. African states are vulnerable faced with these risks. On the one hand, because their individual security capacity uh, for borders and flows are very limited. And also because regional cooperation remains insufficient. And these weaknesses, these vulnerabilities for us constitute a major risk. You have whole regions uh, from the Sahel to the Horn of Africa, from Guinea-Bissau all the way to the Horn of Africa, which are victims of trafficking, violent armed movements, which are way beyond the traditional events in this region. We have seen it in a very uh, spectacular way in Mali, but this is not the only place. Uh, these challenges are not local only, and tomorrow the entire international order could be uh, concerned by it. That's why France says it with force. We are in Africa in order to uh, overcome the risks of weaknesses. We are strengthening peace and international security. And this is what uh, caused us to intervene in uh, the operation in Mali and these days uh, we celebrate its first anniversary. One has to realize that there is a zone of uh, vast circulation of terrorist groups in the entire Sahelian Sahara zone. And these actions uh, by the terrorists can uh, concern our own security directly and is for our security, the security of Mali, the European security and even the world security. That's why we intervened in Mali with the support of our partners and especially uh, US support, our allies, in order to prevent for this country to become a state that would be totally uh, governed by terrorists and jihadists at the gates of Europe. We intervened at the request of the Malian authorities with uh, international support with three goals. First one was to see to it that the uh, progress of the terrorists would be stopped in order to avoid their penetration in the south of Mali and uh, the fall of Bamako, which would have happened a few days later. We reached our aim. Our second aim was to contribute to the dislocation, to attack uh, infrastructures and concentration areas of uh, the different forces of the jihadists all over the territory, destroying their bases. And we largely contributed to that. And then we had a third aim, which was to make it so that Mali would uh, f recover its integrity, its sovereignty, and be on the way to democracy and development. And it is the case today, since now there is an elected president, a national assembly in working order, and a state which is uh, 
in a new s mode of self-confidence. Uh, it's a country that is reconstituting its forces and which can now see its future with uh, renewed serenity. By the way, let me tell you that uh, French forces with uh, African military support uh, have discovered over 250 tons of weaponry which obviously were destined for something else than just the uh, capture of Tombuktu. So it was essential that this uh, operation take place for the security of Mali, but also for our own security in Europe and even for international security. The situation today uh, has improved greatly, but nevertheless, the uh, risks remain especially in the north of Mali, and that is the reason why France has decided to keep in Mali a force of about a thousand troops uh, in the long run in order to have counterterrorism missions if needs be, and these counterterrorism actions uh, are ongoing as I speak. Besides, we have decided, because of the size of the threat, to adapt our military uh, posture all over the uh, Sahelian Sahara zone, because it is essential for us to protect ourselves uh, tomorrow from these risks, even if today, thanks to the uh, UN mission, MINASMA, uh, thanks to the training mission sent by the EU in order to uh, see to it that the Malian army is rebuilt. Even if today we have encouraging elements, nevertheless, we have to avoid any uh, return of the terrorist groups on this territory, but also on uh, the territories of uh, neighboring countries because what I call the uh, trafficking freeway, which is crossing all the zone, uh, is a source of permanent and ongoing threats, not only for Mali, but for all neighboring countries, including Libya, which is a worrisome place, Libya, and France. And I wanted to tell you here today, because it's one of the objective of our uh, meeting with uh, U.S. authorities and especially Chuck Hagel this afternoon, France has decided to reorganize its posture uh, in Africa in order to have all over the zone a larger reactivity, a larger specialization, so that with the support of the neighboring states, we can have prevention actions or interventions in a regional approach so that all together we can uh, make sure that the security of the entire zone is lasting. And uh, this redeployment will uh, uh, cover about 3,000 troops, which we are about to reorganize and redeploy all over the area. I wanted to say all this to you because we think that the intervention in Mali is not enough. We have to go beyond. We have to uh, protect ourselves uh, against different risks, new risks, and especially tomorrow against the risk of a Libyan chaos. Within this Malian strategy, and I've already mentioned it, we've had the support of the United States in terms of transportation, uh, in-flight uh, refueling, intelligence, but also the support of the EU, which today uh, is in charge of training the Malian army. We intervened first, we had the uh, first entry, but very quickly we have enjoyed the necessary support in order to achieve our mission. We had to act quickly. Uh, remember now what happened on January 11th last year, if we had not intervened within two or three days, uh, the penetration of the jihadist groups in the south would have happened, and then you would have had uh, Mali in total chaos, total uh, collapse today. Today, when you go to Mali, you see a country that is vital, even if not all problems have been solved yet. I'd also like to mention with you 
the situation in uh, the Central African Republic, which constitutes a new example, yet another example, of the risks of uh, the weakness of Africa, even if the case is quite different from uh, that of Mali. Since uh, the uh, seizing of power by the Seleka in December, uh, the CAR has gone down a spiral of violence uh, which with sectarian uh, traits. Uh, one thing has to be understood, it's first of all a political problem. It's a manipulation of the sectarian dimension uh, in order to keep power. That is what caused uh, the violence of the last few months. And first of all, it was caused by the client of President Bozizé, but then the representatives of the Seleka in Bangui joined the fray in a country which today is in uh, total uh, disarray. I notice that myself, uh, the state in the Central African Republic has literally disappeared. The administration, the police, uh, justice, uh, the gendarmerie, the military uh, have disappeared totally. Resources have been looted. There is a total political vacuum which gives uh, favorable soil to all trafficking, to radical movements, and uh, to a destabilization of the entire area with collateral effects in Chad, in the Sudan, in the Congo, all the way to the Cameroon. And uh, the triggering of violence, of massacres, uh, the exacerbation of tensions between the different sectarian groups, before we arrived, shows that we were on the very edge of a huge catastrophe. The populations have been uh, pushed to the end, uh, and this is uh, without any precedent at that scale. We intervened at the request of the international community with a mandate from the uh, UN Security Council with a triple mission. First, to ensure that the security level could uh, increase, to see to it that massacres uh, should stop, to ensure that crime was going down. And I could say it today because if we had not intervened back then, there would be hundreds and thousands more dead in that uh, state which is at the edge of the precipice. Our mission is to stay on, to make sure that the uh, security level increases. We end the uh, African forces sent by the AU uh, within what is called uh, MISCA. Our second mission is to make sure that this uh, very African force can be deployed, can be structured, so that it can take over uh, for security purposes in the country. And our third mission is to make sure that the transition, the political transition process takes place as soon as possible. The hypothesis that had been thought first was to provoke elections in February 2015. I think it would be desirable to do that faster. The fact that uh, the transition council has chosen Mrs. Samba Panza as president is a positive element, we need to underline it, we need to emphasize it, and the international community should come to the help of the Central African Republic for its reconstruction and support the president of the Transition Authority. I will note, it's, it is good news that the uh, European Union has decided uh, in this framework to bring about its support by uh, having a U-4 mission which should send 500 military troops in order to complete uh, the action of forces on hand today and to allow French forces and MISCA, but the French troops also, to redeploy more widely uh, all over the uh, Central African territory to start uh, the first elements of a reconstruction. I will note also that uh, while mobilizing $100 million, the United States have already shown 
their commitment in favor of a solution to this crisis. The situation today is mobilizing 1,600 French troops. There is no uh, plan to strengthen physically our presence right now, but we need uh, to make sure that MISCA has uh, the means for its action and international support will be indispensable. The arrival of uh, European uh, forces is part and parcel of that. I mentioned earlier that the uh, situation in Africa uh, caused us to reorganize our uh, system for action and prevention both for our own security but also for the security of Europe and international security and this is also within the framework of uh, the uh, summit of African heads of states who met in Paris at the Elysee summit at the end of last year. These African head of states have reaffirmed their determination to uh, ensure collective security among them and especially they have decided to constitute a rapid reaction force under the premises of the African Union. It's uh, an important progress. Of course between the decision and the implementation there will be some time and of course some opposition or some events but the political will that we saw there should be supported both politically but also financially in order to make sure that Africa is able to face uh, the new security needs that uh, are plenty both within the state but uh, also in a trans-border uh, fashion because the characteristic of Africa is the porosity of uh, their borders which uh, enables all these groups to go from one country to the other without any uh, problem. So this is the problem. This is what I wanted to explain to you. But I insist to say that for us the solution of uh, crisis in Africa goes through the Africanization of the management of the crisis. But to get there today we still need indispensable interventions in order to prevent, uh, to propose Africa from a considerable uh, risk and also suicidal risk. And in this perspective, the United States are, for France, an indispensable partner because we share the same vision of security challenges in Africa, the same vision of the solution. I think that my visit here can also uh, be one more step in the Franco-American partnership as to the question of Africa. This partnership exists, it has been fruitful up to now, it's been useful, it is still useful, and it would be opportune to pur pursue it in the future, both at the operational level, it has been demonstrated during these two crises, but also in uh, uh, the uh, field of training, uh, support to African countries so that they can reconstitute their military, especially in countries that uh, run the risk of having uh, state weaknesses, and finally for their development. Because Africa is a challenge. It's a challenge for itself, for Africa. But it's also a challenge for our security, and tomorrow it is a challenge for the development of the entire planet. So it matters to us for Africa to come back in our strategic debate. And uh, the partnership between France and the United States is quite indispensable. It is also indispensable for this uh, awareness to take place in Europe. But Africa could be the crucible of a strengthening of the partnership between France and the United States, but also between Europe and the United States in the framework of a redefinition of what NATO should be tomorrow. And uh, uh, at the summit next September at NATO, we'll have the opportunity to talk about all this. This is what I wanted to tell you as an introduction. I was 
uh, asked to be uh, brief so that we could have a debate. And so I'm ready now to have a Q&A session, to have a, an efficient session. Thank you. And I'm going to stay here. <coughs> I can sit down. Hear me? Oh, there we go. Good morning. Your microphone's not on, I don't. On. It's on and off. You're good. I try that. Well, thank you. Uh, let me try again, Mr. Minister. Thank you for your uh, powerful and important comments. I'd like to again welcome everyone. I mentioned that as I look out into the room, this is a fan club for you and for, uh, uh, I think, remarkable responsibility that France has um, uh, showed us over the last several months. I know we have many colleagues who would like to offer some thoughts and questions. This is an on-the-record discussion. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to pass the microphone. If you could raise your hand and offer your name and affiliation. Um, because of the translation, we ask that you keep the questions very short as well as, as the comments. Um, I know Dr. Hamry would like to offer the first uh, provocative question, Mr. Minister, if you are ready. So with that, I will pass the microphone to him. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for a very insightful presentation, Minister. Uh, uh, Americans don't know enough about the security issues in Africa. Uh, you've given us a very good perspective this morning, and I would say sincere thank you. You used a very memorable phrase, which was the risks of weakness. And it came across several times in your presentation, the risks of weakness. Uh, defense ministers are always confronted by the risk of weakness when it's too late and we have to use force. I would like to ask you to reflect as a leader of France, not just a defense minister, but as a leader of France to reflect on this question, what do we do about weakness in other countries where the weakness has an impact on our security? Not just military force, but the full range development, diplomacy, or the whole gamut. What do we do about this risk of weakness which pervades the world that we're now living with? It is not a provocative uh, question. I think that uh, what we notice in Africa, and it could be the case on other continents, but it is especially striking in Africa is the fact that when there are uh, decomposition of the state, it is a, a, a call uh, for terrorist groups actually. And that's uh, how they prosper. It was true in Mali. It is true today in the Central African Republic. It could be the case tomorrow somewhere else. And you're right uh, to recall it. Uh, generally speaking, one intervenes in order to avoid that uh, this risk, uh, which we noticed, spreads and uh, catches on fire on other territories. So we intervene afterwards, after uh, the state apparatus is dislocated. I think that uh, the African awareness of the fact that collective security is a uh, good that must be managed by Africans themselves should result in the constitution, first of all, 
of structured military, which are not uh, beholden to clan, one or the other, beholden to a group. And so there is a problem of training, a problem of follow-up. We have to accompany them, support them. And this has to be done uh, by Europe, but also by the international community. It exists in part, but this has to be done uh, in a partnership with the state authorities and in that spirit. But it's not enough. I think that uh, we should have civilian missions on top of it, uh, working on the sovereignty of the states with the police, the gendarmerie, the customs. This is indispensable. The European Union has the tools needed for that. And thirdly, we have to act on the security of their borders to ensure that partnerships between states with international partnership can uh, plug this porosity which tomorrow is going to give us uh, huge problems and i'm thinking about libya right there and for the rest of course there is the necessity to uh, see to it that development uh, is helpful for that countries and does not provoke uh, a flight of the wealth outside of the country. So everything is linked. The interest of some European missions in these situations is that the European Union can bring about a whole spectrum of capacities. But also, it is uh, the interest of uh, peacekeeping operations from the UN and we cannot uh, just satisfy ourselves uh, with an intervention after the other when the major risks happen. We do it. France is facing its responsibilities. But uh, there should be a global awareness of all the risks and all the challenges in that area. Mr. Minister, I, I'm wondering, in addition to the risk of weakness, thank you so much, Ian, the risk of weakness, does, does the, the Atlantic Alliance, does NATO have a risk of fatigue, a risk of exhaustion militarily, economically? You mentioned that the Sahel uh, and the instability in the Sahel needed to be part of the NATO agenda for the Cardiff summit in September. I'm wondering if you could help us understand what uh, items should be on the summit agenda, the new threats, the new challenges like the Sahel, um, and what do you think success would look like coming out of that summit? Uh, uh, I should be clear as to what I said at the end of my uh, speech. Maybe I didn't say the right thing. NATO is a military organization, a defensive organization, which must keep its mission. And uh, what is at stake at the September summit, it's uh, at the same time uh, to see what needs to be done in Afghanistan, for the follow-up. Uh, as of today, there is uh, no proposal on the table. It's one of the topics. But also that NATO should define uh, the way uh, it's going to determine its vocation after Afghanistan with the necessity for us to maintain its uh, vocation. And this vocation, the vocation of NATO, must be strengthened uh, through the fact that interoperability must be one of the priorities. Uh, NATO uh, must be able to uh, react as best as it can. And it has a uh, field of collaboration which is indispensable among us. And this should allow us also to redefine the trans transatlantic link and to redefine as well uh, what is within uh, the competence of NATO and within the competence of other organizations, including the EU. Uh, so uh, we have to see that in total serenity. And 
complementarity actions such as the Sahel, which will necessitate uh, military intervention in a civilian uh, intervention, the EU is quite able to act there. And so the strengthening of uh, a Europe of defense is not in contradiction at all with the clarification of NATO's role in the future years. So these are the subjects that have to be put on the table with uh, the pursuit of the internal reform of NATO, which has started and which has to be uh, finished. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Just one quick follow-up while we stay in Europe, and I promise, hi, Josh, we'll, we'll get to questions. Uh, three years after, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> three years after the Lancaster House Agreement, the UK-France Defense Agreement, give us a state of play on how you believe that bilateral cooperation is going and how important has that been to contributing to uh, a more powerful projection capability for European defense? I'm not sure that uh, if my colleague British were here, he would appreciate your question on the fact that the Lancaster Treaty strengthens European defense, but this is your words. Uh, you assume the responsibility for that. Um, we, at the end of next week, we are going to have the Franco-British uh, Summit, which meets every year, during which we're going to take stock of the application of the Lancaster House Treaty. They have been progress on the uh, progress towards a common uh, core of intervention. We've had some progress also on the industrial, uh, the capacity uh, sector, sorry, with the uh, decision of uh, proc common procurement and common commitment for new capacities that we needed. And I'm thinking about new platforms uh, against uh, ships, for instance, which have been decided in common. There's great progress in the nuclear sector, too. And this is a great progress for us, especially to exchange our capacities in terms of simulation. It had never been done uh, to that extent. But uh, there's a lot to be done yet. We think that the basis of the Lancaster Agreement must not remain between the two of us, but it is uh, to be done in the service of uh, common defense for all of us. This is not easy there. Uh, we have noticed that during the uh, uh, summit of the heads of states uh, in Europe in, at the end of 2013, where before uh, we uh, discussed the decisions on uh, European defense, there were some very restrictive statements from the British Prime Minister, which did not uh, uh, prevent a, a roadmap on European defense. But we see that there's still some ways to go. France is very pragmatic there. And so am I as a defense minister. My position is to say we're going forward the best we can, the fastest we can, with those who want to advance with us. If we start by creating uh, theories, uh, uh, then we can have nice talks and uh, conferences, but this will not allow us to go forward towards uh, European defense within the alliance, which would be capable of uh, having its own responsibilities by itself uh, when necessary, and not France alone. This roadmap of the European uh, Council that took place last December has opened new perspectives in the operational sector, including on the necessity to take into account uh, Sahelian risk, but also on maritime security, and also on taking shorter and quicker decisions in crisis. This Council also allowed us to identify the uh, possibility of cooperating in terms of capacity. There's great progress there uh, in the field of uh, air transport, uh, uh, in-flight uh, refueling. So steps have been made 
and we'll have to do it with uh, people who want to go forward with us. But we uh, should not uh, cut off any avenue. And if France is going forward with Great Britain on some points, we can go forward on other points with other countries and see to it that decisions are taken among different countries for different objectives. I mentioned some of them earlier uh, at the end of the European Council in December. Now let's open the floor. And, oh, I see many hands. So um, why don't we take a few questions and then you can answer. Josh, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. I'm Josh Rogan. I'm a reporter with the Daily Beast here in Washington. Um, as you know, last November, Iran agreed to temporarily suspend its enrichment of uranium to the level of 20% as part of the interim agreement. Last week, Iran's top nuclear negotiator said Iran could return to 20% enrichment within 24 hours. And yesterday, Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif said Iran has not agreed to dismantle anything. My question is, uh, can any final deal that allows Iran to maintain significant enrichment capability in the view of France be considered a good deal? Thank you. Mr. Minister, while you're thinking that very important question, I'll take one more in the back right there, sir. Yes, please, microphones. Hi, Stanley Roth, the Boeing Company. I'd like to ask you to talk less about Africa, but more about interventionary capabilities, expeditionary capabilities in general. In light of the lessons of Libya, where you, the very welcome European intervention was seen as experiencing significant difficulties, and the subsequent defense budget cuts that have taken place in most of Europe and the United States, can this expeditionary capability be retained, much less improved, all at a time when U.S. defense spending is at risk as well? Mr. Minister, Iran, operational capability, Libya. As to the first question concerning Iran, I forgot who asked the question, but we are in a stage of inter interim agreement. We are not in a final situation right now. The fact that uh, sanctions have been taken and that the uh, firmness was there in the last few years was, I think, an element of the change of political attitude and perhaps also the result of the elections in Iran. Uh, the fact that uh, there has been an opening by President Rouhani on this particular questions of uh, nuclear power in Iran. Certain commitments have been made. You reminded him, us of it on uh, enrichment, on Iraq. These commitments must be verified through uh, IAEA. And IAEA today does it seemingly in conditions that are acceptable. But this is only one stage. The final agreement must prevent Iran f from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And therefore, this period uh, on our side, on the side of France, causes great vigilance on the implementation of the interim agreement and also must uh, lead to uh, us being very firm on the impossibility of Iran to ever acquire a nuclear weapon. It's our position. We're extremely firm. We have demonstrated it all through the negotiations. We're going to keep that position. As to the question on uh, the capacity to intervene, well, this is also uh, the case of Africa. It's not only uh, on Libya. we must uh, be able to achieve a greater pooling so that uh, we can react the way we should. It is true in Europe where these uh, pooling efforts start bearing fruit. I mentioned it earlier. But it's also true of the transatlantic relationship. I'm not worried as to our capacity to act. I understood uh, 
with the discussions I've had around here that there was a certain fatigue uh, in the U.S. Uh, as to outside uh, interventions. But when uh, security uh, is at stake, I'm not worried about our capacity to mobilize the different partners in order to uh, intervene uh, to preserve our security. But of course, there could be uh, some concern about the absence of mobilization as to uh, what is at stake when you're talking about military budget in Europe, for instance. As far as France is concerned, we have kept our level and uh, in the financial situation, which is tough because we want to uh, carry out our responsibilities in the long term. But this ought to be shared at the European level and this is the aim of our initiatives to reinforce European defense. Right down the middle and take three questions right here, please. Thank you. Uh, Leo Michel, National Defense University. Uh, given the United States rebalance towards the Asia-Pacific region and French presence in the Pacific, territory, populations, and some military assets, how has the rebalance affected your thinking about the Pacific? And do you see opportunities for increased mil to mil military to military cooperation in the Pacific. Thank you. Irina Gilevska, Macedonian TV, Monsieur Minister. I will ask you about the next summit, uh, whether allies will discuss enlargement and according for us, which uh, member states uh, are willing to uh, accept Macedonia in membership. Uh, Michael Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. Last week, the President of the Republic announced uh, plans for new cuts across the board in the national uh, government. To what extent is this going to affect uh, the defense and military budgets? Mr. Minister. As to uh, the pivot on uh, Asia-Pacific, uh, I've taken note of it. One of the first uh, trip that I did was in Singapore in June 2012. And uh, during that visit, the uh, Defense Secretary, Mr. Panetta, had already uh, announced this orientation what we are saying very simply is that France is also a Pacific nation because uh, we have territories, we are present, and therefore we uh, want to participate in all the security initiatives uh, all over uh, the area. And this is happening today uh, with uh, common exercises, maneuvers, and exchange of uh, information and partnership. As to the enlargement on uh, Macedon, it's not uh, topical right now. It's not, uh, and as to uh, the cuts in the budget uh, for the French budget, yeah, you said cuts. I don't. For I forgot who said the cuts across the board. Across the board cuts. You said yes. We have just finished a very difficult exercise which was that of the uh, military pro program uh, law uh, for our budget. Uh, we had several months of discussions and we ended up with a vote at the parliament. And this uh, military budget law is determining the commitments uh, for France and the French budget for the next six years. The vote uh, took place at the end of December and I have no particular concern about that. take three questions. We'll take the two down here, James, and then the one in the corner. I'm the ambassador of the Central African Republic in Washington. I would like to salute your presence among us and have the opportunity to recall to the 
whole uh, room that uh, the concern uh, that you mentioned concerns Mali and the Central African Republic and the efforts deployed by France in order to ensure uh, security and to fight terrorism uh, which uh, involves not only European security but also world security. This being said, Mr. Minister, I would also like to salute the action of France. France uh, finally arrived in the Central African Republic in order to uh, put an end to the dangers that threaten our country. An American uh, diplomat, when I was presenting my uh, letters, said the Central African Republic has no problem, but the Central African Republic <coughs> lives in a bad neighborhood. So uh, the neighbors, the neighborhood of the Central African Republic caused the, the situation that prevails since the departure of President Bozizé. What uh, do you think? The, the real situation is that the Central African Republic has been invaded by mercenaries. Everybody knows where they come from and who they are. And these mercenaries uh, have uh, jihadist flags, they are terrorists and so on and so forth. Although uh, the uh, uh, ideology is not for sure right now. I don't think that it is a large-scale destabilization, uh, but the whole of the sub-region should be careful. But I have a question about the Central African Republic military. They come from the French military tradition, as you know. They have been trained in French military academies in the United States and a little bit everywhere in the world. But in terms of Resolution 2827, which allows France and MISCA to intervene to bring back security in the Central African Republic, what will be the role of the Central African Republic military in this situation? given the fact that the uh, uh, beginning of the disarmament actions have not been accepted by the population. The population took advantage of the situation in order to loot and uh, carry out revenge. Why? Why did this happen? Because I'm asking a question about the FACA, Mr. Minister. Uh, the Central African Armed Forces, could you tell us what is the role that uh, you think about them? I'm, I'm sorry. Just gonna, we're going to wrap up on that question, Mr. Minister. Oui, Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for your presence. It's a pleasure for me to see you here. Um, as to the mercenaries, they must go. Some have gone already. But they must go for good. We don't want to see them back. And of course, our concern in terms of uh, collective security in Africa is to avoid uh, the composition of pockets of mercenaries in the neighboring states, which could come back in your country or elsewhere. This is a concern that should be a concern for the African Union. As to disarmament, this has to be carried out. I agree with you that uh, it is not easy. Uh, weapons have been hidden. They have been hidden uh, during the day and used at night. Uh, stability in your country will come back only if there is generalized disarmament and it's going to take time and it's the responsibility of the new president. She has to see to it that MISCA and Operation Sangaris can carry out their objectives to its end. As to the FACA, the uh, 
your armed forces. Of course, if Central Africa wants to recover its sovereignty, they need to have an organized military. But the FACAS had totally dissolved. You said it yourself. So it is important to reconstitute the Central African military. It's not going to happen uh, easily. But I have noticed, and you must know it, that a certain number of former military have come back and re-register, get a new number uh, with the chief of staff of the FACA. This has to go on, and it will be necessary, just like Mali, or perhaps a little bit differently, but in the same state of mind, we will need to have uh, a new training for the new Central African forces. It's going to be indispensable for your security. So it is uh, a lot of work. Uh, and you put your finger on it. Thank you so much for your um, thoughtful comments, your powerful remarks, for your leadership, your decisiveness. I'd also like to say a very special word of thanks to the French Embassy, to Ambassador Delatre, your wonderful staff, and my colleague and French visiting fellow Jean-Francois Pactet, who was indispensable in helping us organize this. Mr. Minister, as you can see from your fan club, you need to come back. We have some more questions for you, uh, and we will follow closely the French realignment uh, in, in, in the Sahel, and of course, we'll watch very closely in our cooperation at the NATO summit in September. Many thanks to our colleagues and participants, and uh, we wish you a fantastic weekend. Thank you.